Good evening all, and welcome to tonight's TI Technology Webinar hosted by TI uh, Texas Instruments Australia. Uh, we are really excited to bring you IB Mathematics Standard Level with two very experienced IB teachers, Bajana Graham and Joanna Kipriano. My Hi. name is John Bayman. Good evening, Joanna. It's nice to have you here <laughs> with us this evening. Are you, are you excited for what's ahead? I'm very excited. I'm too excited. I've got to stop. Well, we've seen by how many people are signed in tonight that um, they're excited too. So uh, thank you very much for everyone else who's given up their evening, or equally if you're spending the time watching it on demand. Um, so I teach mathematics to Year 7 to 12 students at Lachlan Catholic College in Darwin, where I use TI technology to help students make stronger connections in their understanding of mathematics. And I'm always excited to introduce this lady, our first panelist for this evening, Ms. Bajana Graham. Good evening, Bajana. Good evening, John and Joanna and everyone. It's nice to have you with us. Thank you very much. As you can see, Bajana is a very talented mathematician, a fantastic senior mathematics teacher at Wesley College in Melbourne, and likes to continually challenge herself and share her knowledge with others through key roles with VCAA, IB, MAV, Pearson's Australia, and Pajama, I'm sure I pronounced that wrong, education. Bajana, how do you find time to do anything else? Well, hard. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. And our second panellist this evening, you've already heard her, Joanna Kipriano. Good evening, Joanna. Hi, John. Joanna has taught all levels of the New South Wales HSC, as well as the IB. Joanna's experience with TIC technology, supporting her peers and students, epitomises what our webinars are all about. Teachers teaching teachers. And she has taken this step of, a step further by producing two iBooks, which are available online. I have to say, I was only looking at them last night, Joanna, on the website, and oh, really? um, getting tempted to, to sign up to them. Yeah, they're on iTunes as I was looking. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> so, well done for doing that. And, and like, um, Bajana, how do you find the time to do all that? I don't know, really. Um, little sleep and uh, <laughs> just using every little free and evening to and all your holidays to um, Well, well done, books. you. <laughs> I feel um, I feel very inadequate now next to both of you two. So but thank you very much for making me feel um, a bit smaller than I was before. Um, Bajana, I think they've heard enough about me, and I'm sure that they would like to to learn from you on some IB techniques that you use in your classroom uh, using the TI Inspire technology. Thank you. Wonderful. Good evening, can see everyone. All yours. Can, can you see my screen now? certainly can. Over to you. So, tonight I will show how we can introduce vectors to our students, and this is more for classroom teaching and some illustration purposes, because most of the vector's functions and features are unavailable in press-to-test mode. Uh, so during exam conditions, they will not be able to use it, but to introduce vectors and and show and show the understanding of vector addition multiplying by scalar those features are available. So if we use the vector matrix and vector in seven, vector unit vector dot product are available for the classroom practice, but not in press to test mode. However, norms which allows you to find the length of the vector is available. So uh, we can use vectors in various ways, but I will open a new document just to illustrate how we use vectors in the calculator mode. If we use this square bracket, we can introduce the coordinates of the point or the position vector. And if I do that and I might say let's call this vector A, and then I do the same thing and put some other values with commas I'm using, and let's say five, and I will call, let's say this is two position vectors, OA and OB. 
So once I have those, I can find vector A, B by going B minus A. And that is quite a useful thing for students because this screen is available in press to test mode. And we as examiners find very often that once they've got two points and are asked to find the position vector AB, they make mistakes there and then, of course, everything is follow through and not very good. If we have that, we can multiply two times vector B. We can do 2B minus 3A and we can make all those operations available and it displays it as the coordinates I, J, and K in three dimensions. So that's available in press to test The other feature which is available is norms. So if I go norms, that will give me the length of vector A. Of course, it will only come up as a decimal because it is a non-cast calculator, so I can find the length of any vector as the decimal, but it's a good feature because then can find it as the exact value and check whether they've got it right. For classroom practice and illustrating things in vectors, if we go to vector, we can do the unit vector, so I can find unit vector A. Again, it will only come up as a decimal. We can go to vector and we can we can do dot product. That's what we use in standard level, and that's enough to go A comma B. And dot product, if we have integers, will of course come up as the integer, but that will not be available in the press to test mode. The other thing they often need to do is find the angle of angle between two vectors. So we use cos minus one, and then again we could just say dot p as I did there, and we can go a comma b on the top, and here we would say length of vector a multiplied times length of vector b. And now, interestingly, if we come to this point and we notice that our calculator is in radians, so of course the answer is in radians. We advise standard level students to be always in radians, otherwise they can't sketch circular functions graphs, but that's an easy fix. They can simply go to here, choose the conversion error, and press decimal degrees and it will change the angle to degrees. So this is something the students really need to be aware of when using their calculators. And also the other feature, if they are using, let's say, trig and they go 10 minus one in a similar way and they go two over three and get that thing they can again change to degrees using decimal degrees. Also being in radians, if we just use the trig functions, we can override the radian setting by choosing the degree sign and the value will come correct. So when they use sectors, arcs, and so on, being in radians is Advisible, but sometimes they need to then do some trick and find the angle in degrees. So this is changing to decimal degrees or overwriting the radiant setting by putting the degree sign, which can be found here. Found here. We only really do degrees, no minutes and seconds in uh, IB, so that is enough. Uh, another uh, file I have here, this one was actually constructed by Peter Fox and it is on our Australian website. And it was done for CAS, but I adopted it slightly for non-CAS. So this is a nice introduction to vector addition, both using, as it says here, head to tail method. 
So it says drag the tail of vectors A and B to show that A plus B equals C. So if we get to this screen and we need to go head to tail and then grab this point so the students can, can make this construction. The other one is using the parallelogram method. So here we are to go A plus B. So again, if we are using now the parallelogram method, so I need to get my things like that and show that, of course, we've got to make it a bit, and then show that C is the diagonal of the parallelogram. So that is a nice activity for the students to play with. This is just using the unit vector phi and j. We can only do two dimensions here. Some other operations on vectors, but this one is quite nice to illustrate what happens when we multiply vector a by a scalar. So if n is one, they are equal length, then if we have n 1.5 and two, and the, the other thing is if we go the other direction, if that's minus 0.5 or minus one, so <clears throat> showing that two vectors are parallel if one is a number times the other vector. And the last activity here is by changing again some points, we can see how the length of the vector varies. So that is quite a nice file which will be available for <coughs> you to download later. The other thing we can do, we can actually draw vectors and measure the angle in two dimensions. So I might again illustrate how to do the vector construction. If we get into the <coughs> graph screen, we could use geometry, but that's all right. So if we go to menu geometry, I just want to put three points anywhere. And then again, this feature I'm using now, actions, coordinates and equations is not available in press to test, but for the class demonstrations and illustrations and place it is. If we have particular numbers, we can just override those things when we got some coordinates, because the numbers usually more or less exact values or integers. We can make it one, and then let's make it two and minus, let's say four. So I've got those points and now I can construct vectors by going to geometry and that is in points and lines and vector. So that will be available in the exam, however, the points will not. So I go from here to there and I go from here to here and then I can also close it. Uh, well, to make it nicer, if you go to attributes, you can make it thicker, you can change the color, and so on for the students to play with. Most importantly, we can go to measurement, again, only available in non-press to test, and we can find the length of each of those. And we can also measure the angle, let's say between those two vectors, we could also put A, B, C, letters and so on. So it is also in measurement angle, we need to go clockwise for the <coughs> acute angle or not reflex angle. Again, because we are in radians, that we can go to menu and settings and we can change the graphing angle to the degrees and here it is. So that is a nice activity for vectors and of course once we change it we see the angle changes, it's all dynamic and the lengths change and, and so on. So that's something to play for the students in two dimensions. So the other one I have constructed here is the vector equation of a straight line. 
So I have my direction vector, point O, position vector A, and the point P, which moves along the line. So you can just grab that and see how many of those vectors we can put here. Or if we move point to the other direction, it has to be opposite of this vector. So that's just a nice illustration, nothing special, but it's something which students would enjoy. And I know from experience, the first time they see the vector equation of the line, they find it quite difficult. <clears throat> Talking about degrees and uh, radians, I also show how we can <clears throat> use our calculator easily with sine cosine rule and see the difference between numerical solve and poly roots. So I have this example here where we have two sides and the angle, and it is an ambiguous case. So let's say how would we do it? So if we get the calculator screen, we simply go to algebra and we say numerical solve and we need to enter, these were the values we have, over sine. And now because I'm in radians, which probably is a good idea for this one to change to degrees because that will make it easier without having to put the degree sign all the time. So once I'm in degrees now, I just need to put 35 degrees and I say equals, and I have another fraction, 16 over sine b, and then I go comma b. So I get my first angle. Now how can we get the other angle? The other angle we get if we say, given that we know this other angle has to be greater than 90 degrees, and that solves our ambiguous case once it's recognized. The other example is using the cosine rule. Again, from examiner's experience, they either forget to take the square root of or get things mixed up. So what's an easy way to do it is, if I actually go there, but what I will do, I will put a new problem because I already had some A's and B's and it is just to overcome those. So what we can do, I will enter the values. So I will say 10.6 was my A. Then I had 12.8, which was the length of the side B and 8.2 was the length of side C. So now all they need to do with numerical solve is go algebra, numerical solve. They just need to enter the cosine rule. A squared equals B squared plus C <coughs> squared Minus, here it's very important, they need to have time sine times B times C times sine. Also important thing, I can't call this A again because the calculator does not recognize small capital letters. So we need to use theta, close the bracket, and go again, solve for theta. So that's a neat way of doing that, and it overcomes all the difficulties when introducing incorrectly. The, the other file I had in here is the one which, again, deals with the problem of numerical solve and polyroots. So this is an example. We have a sector with the perimeter 32 centimeters and area of 63. And we are to find the radians length and the magnitude of the angle subtended at the center of two possible sectors. So looking at the information, we form two equations. And then we eliminate theta to come up with the quadratic equations. 
So of course, if they start using polyrose, they will get one answer, but not the other. So again, if I say insert a new problem, that's a good thing for the students to do. So here I would go to algebra and I would use polyroots. It is a quadratic, so I put the values negative 16 and 63, and then we get the two answers. If I try to use numerical solve for the same thing, so having x squared or r squared minus 16x plus 63, x I equals 0, my mistake. We need to have an equation because that's solving equals zero, I get a seven. I can force the other answer. Again, I know it's a quadratic, so it's only two answers, so I can do the guessing. I can say it's either greater than seven or less than seven, and the calculator will give me the other answer, but that's probably not the ideal thing to do. So polyroots in this case would be the preferred method. So, the other thing we'll look at today, we'll be looking at normal distribution because we have the probability listed there. So I will look at the normal distribution because looking at other probabilities in the given time won't be quite enough. So I get the new page and what I will try to draw, I will try to draw the normal case. So I need to start with the spreadsheet just to name two variables. So all we do in the spreadsheet, we say have x here and probability. And then I get the statistics graph and I put x here and I put probability there. Now if we go to menu in analyze, we can plot function, plot value, then we can shade under the curve. So I will plot a normal curve. So Plotting, we need to go normal PDF, and you see it changes, so it recognizes the function. We start with x, let's say we'll do a 105. Of course, if I enter that, nothing happens because my window is not correct. So let's go, we need about two standard deviations to the left, so let's say about 80, 115, so go to 120, and the maximum is usually not very big, about 0.1 usually do. So this is the normal curve with mean 100 and standard deviation 5. Now we can illustrate what is the probability within 1, 2, and 3 standard deviations from the curve. So to do that, I need to plot value, and my first value will be 95, and then I can do the same. I do plot value, and I need to have 105. So uh, this area under the graph is within one standard deviation from the mean, and now I can shade. So I want to shade from here to then try again, menu, analyze, shade from this value to this value, and we get 0.68. I can now do two standard deviations from the mean, so I go plot value, so I need to go 90, and then again, menu, analyze, plot value to 110, and I again can do the similar thing. I can shade from there to there, and it shows me this area. If I go to the calculator screen now, and I go to variables, you see that all those are actually listed in the variables. Whatever you do in statistics, you can always find it in variables. So 
So what I can do now, I can all now, I can also get those values by going to probability distributions. This time, of course, I use normal CDF and I could go from V1 to V2 and I need to say that's 105 and I will get this value and I could, of course, change to V3 and 4 and you could do also three standard deviations. And that's a nice activity for the students because we think on average it's not exactly and not to be used with those values necessarily, but that is a nice illustration. The other thing students really struggle with is uh, using so inverse normal poll. So what I have here, I actually constructed a poll question which I would send to students when teaching inverse normal to trick them again because we have probability x is greater than a is 0.27 and we want them to find the answer. So once you construct your poll, you get the correct answer there by ticking it. How do we get the poll if I want to prepare a new document? Of course, I could go insert and we have question here. So I might do A, B, C, D, true, false or something else. You can copy and paste things. So if you have a navigator, that's a very nice thing to do. And these are the results you can see once you send the poll to the class and they send it back. So you see three students were mistaken here because they used 0 0.27, 0 0.27 instead of one minus that. The rest got the exact answer. So this is something which is really nice to do. And other uh, things where the students really find really difficult is using the questions with, so I have a file here again, similar things we did, but this is one of the questions by when we know the mean and we are looking for the standard deviation and the probability that x is greater or equal to 19 is 0 0.7, so I actually prepared here the notes page because we always running out of a time, out of time a bit. So this is what we can do. And uh, you will find in my file some other polls for normal distribution. I think my time is up now. So thank you very much for your attention. And now uh, Joanna will talk about statistics. Thank you. Thanks, Bajana. Uh, just before I pass over to um, Joanna, somebody mentioned the normal CDF thing that you did with V1 and V2 and you changed the bounds. Uh, is that possible mm -hmm. in press to test mode? Yes, that will all work in press to test. Everything you have in graph works in press to test and variables, yes, that will all work. And I take it that you use Navigator quite a lot in your classroom? Yes, the Navigator is fantastic. You get an immediate feedback and see whether students understood where they make the mistakes and they actually love it. You can use the presenter and if someone does something interesting or come up, comes up with a nice solution. So yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's very immediate, isn't it? It's fantastic. So thanks for that. Absolutely. That was wonderful. Some great, great points there. And Joanna, um, we can see your screen. It's all yours. Thank you, John. Um, hi everyone, I hope everyone's enjoying the webinar so far. So I'll be going over statistics, uh, both one variable and two variables. Uh, I'll do an example that compares two data sets using box plots. And if we have time, I'll go over an exam style question from paper two for SL. Okay, so we're starting with this example for one variable statistics. It says a group of students at a concert were surveyed on their age. The data collected is in the spreadsheet. So for this data, find the mean, the five point summary, the interquartile range, the population standard deviation, the variance is in graph a histogram, and graph a box plot. Okay, so I've got my data over here. I've already put it in. 
in case you're completely new to the spreadsheets, you can just click on any um, cell using your trackpad, just tracing over your trackpad and then clicking. And then you can just uh, type, for instance, I've called this age, A-G-E, I've called number one because I'm using H somewhere else just in case. And then go down to your data and enter your data, so 12, enter 13, enter and so forth. Okay, so first things first, I want to find the mean. So I'm going to press menu and then go to statistics, stat calculations, and choose one variable statistics. I'm using my mouse pad and the cursor, which you can do on the trackpad, otherwise you can just press the numbers. Okay, so number of lists, just one. Now your X1 list, so where's your variable, your X variable? That's in column A, so that's what that means there. So I can just leave it like that, or I can move my cursor over to this triangle, press it, and I can actually choose age one, which is what I called that column. My frequency list, um, the default is to leave frequency at once. There's like one of everything. I don't want that. I click on the arrow again, and I choose freq, which is what I called my frequency column. So now if I press down, And here is where we put where we want the results to show up in our spreadsheet. And for some reason, TI Inspire um, likes to, the default is column B, but we've already got data in column B. We don't want anything in there. So I delete the B and type in C, click Enter, and use all my statistics. So the first one here, as you know, that means mean. So the mean of this um, statistics is 16.2955 or 16.3 to 3 significant fear. Next, I want my five point summary. So if we scroll down, down our column, here we go. Our five point summary, if you know it's the minimum value, the quartile one, median, upper quartile, and maximum value, so that they all are there. The minimum value is 12. Quarter 1 is 15, median is 16.5, Q3 uh, quarter is 18, and the max value is also 18. Next, we want the interquartile range. So we're going to obviously do 18 minus 15, which is 3. And um, I always remind my students that um, I actually want to see on their question paper the 18 minus the 15, because often they're given marks for showing that they know what those quartiles are. And now we need to find the population standard deviation. Generally in SL, we use the population standard deviation, which is oops, this one right here. So to three significant figures, our population standard deviation would be 1.49. And next we want the variance. Scroll down on my notes, the variance. So to work that out, we need to square the standard deviation. Now, you can actually do this calculation calculation within your spreadsheet if you like. So just like in Excel, if you want to calculate something in a cell, you would press equals first. So click on your cell, press equals, and then I'm going to choose my standard deviation. So click on that cell, and then I want to square it. Now, um, to get back into the cell that I'm typing in, click inside it, so my cursor's back, square it, so press X squared here, enter, and there's my variance there, which will be 2.21 to three significant figures. Okay, so now we just want to do some graphs. We want a histogram and a box plot. So I'm going to go back to my data, press across. Okay. So I'm ready to do a graph, so I press menu, data, this time not statistics, and I can choose a summary plot. Now my X list is my age one, my summary list I can choose my frequency. Now I can display it on a split page, so split the screen, have half of it be a um, graph, or how about you do a whole new page, looks nice. Okay, so here's my histogram already, the default was histogram. So there it is. Um, however, I want, now I want a box plot. So I press menu, plot type, 
box pot, I can choose it. And there's my box pot for my data. Okay, so we've now finished. That's basically one go of statistics, the main things they should know. Okay, students should know I should say. Okay, so now two variable statistics. Uh, so my question is, 10 people were surveyed on their age in years and their height in centimeters. The results are in the spreadsheet, so they're just here. So there's age two and my height for each person. For so this data, we want to find the correlation coefficient. We want to graph a scatter graph. And we want to graph the line of this bit and state its equation. Okay. I make sure my um, cursor is clicked on a cell in my X column, my independent variable column. And when I press menu, uh, statistics, stat calculations. Now I've got a couple options here. I can press two variable statistics or linear regression. Um, because I don't really need the regression line equation right now, I'm going to show you two variable statistics. We'll get to this one later. Okay, so my X list is in A, but I like to choose my age two. My Y list, my second variable, that was height, so I'm going to choose that. Okay, frequency is fine, I can leave that and go down, down, down. Okay, once again, I need to change this to column C because I don't want to override my data in column B. Okay, press enter, and here is my statistics. If I go across one to my next column, oh sorry, so we've got your X mean, 44.6, so that's the mean of the ages. And now if we scroll down, 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 okay, there's my Y mean, there's the average of the heights as well. It looks like, well, you want to want the correlation coefficient, and here it is there. Negative 0 0.5543, and you can see all the decimal places here. Now, hopefully students realize that that means there's a moderate negative correlation between the age and the height. So now we want to do a scatter plot. So we go back to, I like to go back to my um, X variable cells. And I press menu, data, and this time I'm going to go quick graph. I find this the easiest way. Oops, didn't want to. Okay, let's try again. Menu, data, quick graph. Okay, let me try this. There we go, we got there eventually. Okay, so. Now, as you can see, it's only got the age variable. Where's my height? So I want my height to be the Y variable, the uh, dependent variable. So I click on here, and I choose height. And there's my beautiful scatter graph. OK, so now I want to graph the linear regression equation on line or the line of this bit. So menu, action, analyze frame. Regression, and I want my linear regression line. I like to choose MX plus B. I'm used to that form. You could um, choose A plus BX if you like. Okay, so there's my um, line of this bit or regression line, and there's its equation. So it would be Y equals negative 0 0.231 times X plus 173. So that's my regression equation. Okay. So that's my two variable statistics example. Now we're going to have a look. What if we have two lists of data and we want to compare them? So my next example is class A and class B both have 10 students. All these students set a test and their scores are out of 30 are recorded in the spreadsheet. Find the mean for both classes. Okay. So here's my two classes, class A, class B. So we want to go menu. Statistics, start calculations. Now, again, one variable statistics, but number of lists this time I actually have two, the class A and the class B. So I'm going to move that up to two. Press OK. 
Okay, my X list is in the A column. I'm just going to leave it this time. My X2 list is in the B column, which is also just column B. My results, again, I want to change that to column C. Press OK. Now, sometimes this comes up. It's getting confused. Is A with a B bracket a column or a variable? That's because I've also called it column A. So I'm going to tell it it's a column reference. Press OK. And now it's figured it out. So now if I go across, you might think, well, which one's which? Which one's for class A? Which one's for class B? Which of the statistics? If you go up here to oops, cancel. If you go up here, have a look, this will tell you this column is for column A, or in other words, class A in our, play, in our case. So this is, this is class A. Over here is for column B or the class B. So that's the statistics for B. So as you can see, the mean mark for class A was 20.3, whereas the mean mark for class B was 21.4. And now I want to graph parallel box plots for the classes. Okay, so I am going to go back to my data. Okay, and I press menu, data, and summary plot. Okay, I'm just going to leave all of that as it is. X list A. So at the moment I'm ignoring B, I'm just pressing something for A. And I'm going to choose a new page again. Okay, so the default is histogram, but I want a box plot. So menu, plot type, box plot. Okay, there it is. But I've only got the box plot for class A. So I press menu. Properties, okay. So now it's a bit confused. It's considering A also to be the Y variable, so I'm going to remove that. Okay, and there's my box plot again for class A. Now, I can add next variable, and I want to add B. So now here it is, my box plots for class A up here in the blue, and class B in the yellow wool slash orange. Okay, and so we can see pretty easily, now that it's displayed this way, uh, which class actually did better. This kind of thing might be particularly useful um, for an IA if you're comparing two sets of data and you get students need on a graph of some sort to compare them to um, support their findings. So as we can see, graph B, the maximum value is higher, the upper quartile is higher, whereas the medians are similar and um, the lower quartile is similar, but the lower extreme is also higher than for class A. So this definitely supports the idea that class B did better in the test. Okay, so now we're going to have to go an exam style question. So this is based on two variable statistics. So it says the price of a used car depends partly on the distance it has traveled. The data in the spreadsheet shows the distance in X kilometers and the price Y dollars for seven cars on the 1st of January 2018. So here's my data there. So this is kilometers and this is the price of the car. Okay, so question A, the relationship between X and Y can be modeled by the aggression equation Y equals AX plus B. So we want to find the correlation coefficient and write down the value of A and of B. This time we need to find that uh, equation, the regression equation. So let's go back to our data. Okay, so we're going to go menu, statistics. And then start cal I'll say start calculations. And this time we're going to choose linear regression. Okay. So my X list is in column A, so that's all fine. My Y list is Y, so I'm going to choose Y this time. And I'm going to scroll down. And again, I want my results in column C. Okay, press OK. All right. So now, it said my regression equation is in the form mx plus b, where that is m and that is b. So it means that my actual equation 
is y equals negative 1.58 times x plus 33,480. And my correlation co coefficient is here, negative 0 0.994. So we've got a very strong negative correlation between the two variables. Okay, so find, when it says find the value of A and B, A in this case is the gradient and B is just the constant term. So A is actually this. To answer the question, A is negative 1.58 and B is 33,480. Okay, let's scroll down. On the 1st of January 2018, Lena buys a car which travels 11,000 kilometres, use the regression equation to estimate the price of Lena's car, giving the answer to the nearest $100. So I want to use this equation to, to estimate the price. So I'm going to just do it in my spreadsheet. Press equals, this value here, click back in it, times my 11,000 that they gave us in the question plus maybe, and press enter. And that is our 11,000 kilometer car. That should be the price, $16,089.80. However, the question I set to round it to the nearest hundred, so it'd be $16,100. Okay. Lena will sell her car when its price reaches $10,000. Find the year when Lena sells her car. I forgot to mention, uh, basically, I forgot to add in the question, um, the Lena's car is depreciating by 5% each year. And so, Lena will sell her car when its price reaches $10,000. Find the year when Lena sells her car. Now, I find this kind of question is best done in graphs. So, we can work at a graph to model when it's how much it's depreciating by, and then figure out when it'll hit $10,000 or when it'll be closest to $10,000. So, let's add a graph page. Sorry, press doc. No, sorry. Press on. And down here, I want to choose a graph. Okay, so as we know, her car was $16,100 from the previous question. And we're timesing that using depreciation. 1 minus zero, the depreciation rate, so 0 0.05. Okay. And to the power of how many years it takes, I would just know, so that's actually our variable. So I'm just going to put X in there. And I want to graph that. Now I can't see it, and that's okay, because what I can do now, say menu, table, split screen table, and I've got my values, okay? So in other words, when X is 1, so when one year's gone by, it's going to be worth 15,295. Now up here, I click on here, it should have our equation for us. And there's the equation there. So it's actually giving us all the values of the depreciation equation of the various values of x. So in one year, it'll be that value and so forth. So if I keep scrolling down, I'm looking for a value as close to 10,000 as possible. As we can see here, is the closest value to $10,000. And that's after nine years. So if she bought the car in 2018, then 2027. So the year when Lena sells her car would be 2020. Okay, so now we have time for a little bit more. One more exam style question. So each day a factory records the number of boxes it produces in the total production cost Y. The results for nine days of spreadsheet. Write down the equation of the regression line Y on X. Okay. So here's my data. 
I want the regression equation. Stack calculations, uh, linear regression, once again, X list is column A. Uh, this is just Y. And I want the results C. And here it is. So the regression equation would be Y equals 10.7 times X plus 121. Estimate the cost of producing 60 boxes. So 60 is X and I'm going to Y. So that'll be equals this times the 60, 60, so the gradient times 60 plus, oops, sorry, it didn't work. Okay, so this value here, click back in it, that's why it didn't work, times 60 plus and the y to set there. Let's try it again. Plus, okay, that's how you did. Enter. Okay, so that is the cost of making 60 boxes. Now, the factory sells boxes for 1999 each. So that's what the, um, the income, find the least number of boxes that the factory should produce in one day in order to make a profit. So what I could do is graph an equation that, that shows the income. So that would be like y equals 1999 times x. So if I graph that and graph the regression equation that is about the uh, cost and find their point of intersection, That'll help me find how many they need for a profit. So I go to graphs. I graph 19.99 times X for the profit or the income. Graph that line. And then I press tab to graph another line. I'm going to graph the equation, the regression equation, I should say. So what was that? That was let's say 10.7 times X plus 121. So 10.7 times X plus, I think it was 121. Enter. Yep. Okay, so I can't see the other one, so I'm just going to zoom out. Window zoom, zoom out, there it is. So there's my two graphs, and I want to find their point of intersection. Okay, there it is somewhere in there. So to find the point of intersection, menu, analyze graph, intersection, from there to there, easy. So I get a 13. So at the intersections of 13, that's when I kind of break even for the two. So to get an actual profit, I would need to sell more boxes. So I would get a uh, 14. So 14 boxes would get me a profit. And that's it. Thank you. Wow. There we go. You uh, certainly filled in a fair bit there, Joanna. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great. And um, yeah, we uh, we did have a few questions coming in, and, and each time that they were asked, um, you uh, sort of answered them along the way. So that was great. Oh, fantastic. I will uh, take over now okay. and and share my screen. So so thank you very much for that. Uh, you did a great thank job, you. and um, and hopefully um, I know that Pajana was with us. Pajana, you're still with us now. Yes, I am. <laughs> like two seasoned pros there. It's, uh, your your <laughs> students must be both. Uh, all of them must be very lucky to have you as their teachers. Well, oh, thank you, Dylan. Thank you, John. <laughs> I'm, I, I wish I, I wish I was a student in your class. I have to say. Uh, so thank you very <laughs> much for that. Uh, we're going to begin wrapping things up. Uh, if you do have any last-minute questions, please try and get those asked. Try and get those asked. Uh, I know Bajana and Joanna will endeavour to answer them, or we can equally mm -hmm. add them to the planning of, of future webinars. Uh, when you do leave this evening, uh, there will be a brief survey, which will automatically appear here in your browser. Your feedback does guide us as we plan future online events. And we do listen to your feedback, so we hope you share your thoughts in a post-webinar survey. 
Importantly, your certificate of attendance will be emailed to you in the next 48 hours, along with a link to the on-demand and YouTube version of the recording, as well as the relevant documents that both Bajana and Joanna mentioned, showed, and are willing to share with you. And I think that's um, a fantastic feature of, um, of TI, um, not only in Australia, but um, around the world, uh, that, that all these documents are available free for anyone to access just on the TI Australia website. Um, and the TI Europe and, and America websites as well, all free for anybody just to log into. So not even log into, just to, just to access. So uh, if you do leave tonight and you do have any post-webinar uh, questions, please phone or email TI Australia. I know they'd love to hear from you. Uh, and if they can answer your questions, I know that they'll put you in touch with people like Bajana and Joanna to answer them uh, for them. So please, um, please keep in touch because TI are here for you to um, get the best out of your teaching so that your students not only fully understand what they're doing, but actually have a passion for mathematics as well. Sadly, that brings us to the end of tonight's webinar. Thank you so much, Bajana and Joanna, for everything you've shared with us this evening. I know I've really appreciated it. I'm sure everyone else has. Thank you, thank John. You John. Thank you, Joanna. And thank you, Bajana. It was great. And thanks, everyone else, for joining us. Uh, we do this for you. So. Um, I hope you found it beneficial. I hope you get a chance to watch it on demand and share it with your colleagues. And uh, we hope to see you back on online soon. So thank you very much and good night.